true life and music history. The Ants Human Stars podcast with your hosts, Caleb and Digo. Are you ready? Steady. Go. Go story time. Ready? Ready. It's late October 1978 in Colorado Springs when Ken Odell, a closeted member of the Ku Klux Klan, receives an encouraging sign that his strategy of placing ads in the personal section of the local paper for new recruits has met with some success. Ken has been sent a letter from a man called Ron Stallworth. Ron, he says in his letter, wants to further the cause of the white race and to join the Klan. Before long, the two men are having a great time over the phone. Ken, who loathes blacks, Jews, Catholics, and any other minority he can think of, sees Ron as a kindred spirit. Ken is so impressed by Ron that over the coming months, He will not only make sure that Ron gains membership and full access to the Ku Klux Klan, but he'll even tout him as a future leader of their local chapter. Unfortunately for Ken, there are a couple of things about Ron that he didn't know about and wouldn't know about until 28 years later when Ron reveals that first, Ron was an undercover police officer. Hmm. And second... And this never fails to crack Ron up every time he thinks of it. Ron is black. (laughs) (laughs) I was having a lot of fun, Ron says. Today, I'm going to dive into the story of Ron Stallworth. My sources are the Guardian article titled, The Black Detective Who Infiltrated the Ku Klux Klan by Stephanie Marsh. And... Spike Lee's Oscar award-winning movie called The Black Klansman. <laughs> did, you, did you see that? Um, I haven't seen it. It's amazing. Oh, it's an amazing dude. movie. It's hilarious. It, like, uh, it's also very strong and powerful and everything, but no, it's actually very, very funny mm-hmm. because Ron Stallworth is funny. And, and everything that he did was... It's just amazing, mm-hmm. and I'm going to get into it. Um, okay. So the story of how a black police officer infiltrated the KKK is obviously hard to wrap your mind around. And you may question how can it possibly be true? But let's take into account late 1970s technology. And it becomes a little bit easier to understand how such a ridiculous police thing could even ever have come to pass. Um, No internet, no smartphones. Yeah. Terrorist organizations had to rely on letter writing and telephone calls for their secret communications. So Ken had no way of knowing, for example, that the voice on the other end of the phone line spouting hates against slaves and mud people belonged to anyone but what Ken liked to call an intelligent white man like himself. Hmm. And Ken fell for it. (laughs) Um, Fortunately, the people I was dealing with weren't the brightest bulbs in the socket. Ron said. What happened next was the proudest, most off-the-wall moment of his career in law enforcement. But funny as it was, it was an investigation that we took seriously because the Klan's intent was very serious, Ron said. Ron was well known for having set up the state's first gang task force, but when asked to name his most significant career achievement, he dropped a bombshell and said, Yeah, that year I went undercover with the KKK. (laughs) Um, Ron was 21 when he joined the police as a patrol officer, the only black person working in the entire department. And uh, the Klan investigation came out of the blue four years after that. So Ron is, yeah, he was, he like started at 21, the only black officer. yeah, of course. Yeah. And um, but yeah, he has he had a mission. Mm-hmm. Um, he had a mission to be a cop in the 70s. Yeah. He had a mission. Let's 
take down some bad people. I have a mission. Let's infiltrate the KKK. I mean, like this guy, mm-hmm. he wasn't boring, obviously. <laughs> um, and so uh, Ron is now 65, uh, living a comfortable married life. He's retired, though still deeply loyal to the police force. And there's a grouchy rebelliousness to him. I don't care what they think, he said when asked what his former colleagues, his parents, the KKK, the world would make of his surveillance work or anything else. In his wallet, he carries a memento, his clan membership card issued in 1979. He was ordered to destroy all the evidence of the investigation, but he kept that card anyway. (laughs) Um... There have been talk over the years of this story being made into a film, and the director, Spike Lee, finally gave the project a green light. Ron was very excited, somewhat overwhelmed, that the film director flew him to New York for a read-through of his film adaptation of Ron's life. This movie wouldn't have been made if Trump wasn't occupying the White House. Ron won't dignify the present incumbent with the word president. Snap. (laughs) Snap. Like it's poetry. Uh, (laughs) Charlottesville, where neo-Nazis and white nationalists clashed with anti-fascist demonstrators, accelerated Lee's race to get the film finished. The question arose, how could Ron, a black man, have possibly embedded himself into the white supremacist organization? What happened when he had to meet these people in the flesh? I call my friend Chuck, Ron said. (laughs) Uh, It was never actually intended to be a sting. The police were worried at the time and wanted to find out more about the Klan activities. So Ron did some homework. Um, He saw an ad in the newspaper. And when he saw that ad, wrote back. And he thought he, I don't know, they just sent him some some pamphlets or something, you know, like just some, mm-hmm. some, some material, some reading material. Join us. Be racist. Be racist. Um, instead, Ken Odell called him directly, identified himself as a local organizer of the quote, the cause. Um, Ron hadn't been prepared for that phone call, but had the presence of mind to include in his letter an untraceable number, which fed directly into the police department. Mm-hmm. That said, he made two big mistakes. <laughs> he signed the letter to the KKK with his own name. And, quote, I broke the most basic rule of all, and that was going into a case without a plan of operation first. Uh, talking to Ken that the first time, Rom improvised as best he could. Quote, my sister was recently involved with a N-word. Ron angrily told Ed Ken during the phone call. And every time I think about him putting his filthy black hands on her pure white body, I get disgusted and stick to my stomach. You're the kind of person we're looking for, said Ken. When can we meet? Chuck now enters. Stage left. (laughs) Uh, Ron decided there need to be two Ron Stallworths, the black version himself who would continue written correspondence and manage the untraceable phone line. And the white version, Chuck, a friend of Ron's who worked in the narcotics department, who would deal with the KKK's cloak and dagger meetups when they arose. Mm. Chuck was game, but senior staff were against the idea, arguing, they'll know you're a black man from the sound of your voice. Ron explains so. that the U.S. law enforcement was exactly. Ron explains that the U.S. law enforcement was somewhat confused between its own prejudices and the determination to crack down race hate crimes. <laughs> um, they didn't want a replay of the riots of the late 1960s and the early 70s, white supremacist groups and the other extreme Black Panthers, covertly or not, advocated armed combat. So in Denver. Uh, The Klan had recently burned several crosses and uh, a black man escorting a white woman to the cinema had been shot dead. Anti-Semitism was on the rise. Wow. So the police were like, okay, um, if we let this continue, the Black Panthers are going to come. That's the way they were thinking. Mm -hmm. They weren't like really thinking, oh, let's stop Stop. this and help 
No, they were just like, oh no, the Black Panthers are gonna come. The Black Men with their guns. <laughs> um. So his fellow black friends and colleagues did not take well to Ron joining the police force. He said they thought I was now too white or too blue, (laughs) Uh, but I didn't care, he said, and I still don't care what anyone thought. He charmed and bulldozed the powers that be that not every black person shucked and jived and or engaged in criminal behavior. Um, they harbored no bigotry against me personally, but they hadn't reached a point where they could see past their stereotypes. The grocery and bicycle store on Main Street, Colorado Springs, are no longer there, but the Quick Inn is still standing. A 1950s diner, it looks exactly as it did when Ken chose it as a location for his first meeting with Ron. Mm. He was to turn up there at 7 p.m. when he would met a skinny, cigar-smoking white man with a mustache who would take him to a secret location to discuss his eligibility for membership of the Klan. Chuck, the white Ron, set off, wired up, and head over with uh, the black Ron and Jimmy, another narcotics investigator. Uh, Jimmy and black Ron trailed uh, Chuck's movements from a surveillance vehicle. Uh, A few miles later, the skinny cigar smoker pulled up outside the dive bar that the local clan used as its recruitment center. Uh, Ken was inside with another man and had a clan membership form for Ron. Uh, Ken was 28, short and stocky, an army man. Ken was satisfied that Ron didn't have any... Now, so this was white Ron, all right? So... Even though there was a white man in front of him, Ken was satisfied that white Ron didn't have any Jew in him. <laughs> so it's like white, but you got to be like, I know, I would white, never white. understand it. That's so weird. Ridiculous. Yeah, like, it was ridiculous. And so he explained that the membership cost $10, but new recruits had to pay extra for the robe and cloak. Um, only once did any members of the clan get suspicious. Chuck had been in a meeting with the clan members and there had been something I wanted to follow up on. So a couple hours later, Chuck left the meeting. I called Ken. He immediately said, what's wrong with your voice? So I coughed a bit and said I had a sinus infection. (laughs) Um, Ken proceeded to prescribe me a a remedy. Um, The deeper the investigation probed, the less laughable and inept the clan's men became. Soon after the first meeting, Ken called Ron to invite him to his house. Ken and a small group of quote-unquote losers, Ron's words, um, were assembled in the living room, including the group's second-in-command, its treasurer, and a bodyguard. Plans to burn 17-foot crosses were discussed and finalized. Everyone in the group agreed it would be a deeply moving religious experience. Jesus exactly. <laughs> okay. um, publicly, the Klan were against violence. However, Ken gave White Ron the tour of his own personal arsenal, which included 13 shotguns, plus the weapons he carried in his vehicles. As special guests at his next rendezvous, Ken invited the leaders of a powerful Nazi survivalist group. Together, they watched a screening of a nationalist film and discussed collaborating on terrorist activities. So, you know, it was a little bit more than hatred. They were they were trying to act. So I also find it interesting on the outside. They're like, oh, no, we're not for violence. It's a lot harder to get away with it. The the general Mm -hmm. idea of like, oh, you just killed a black guy who cares is no longer. And so Mm -hmm. it's like anyway, I'm just I just find it interesting how like really if they could get away with it, they would be violent. They would be just outward. But because it's no longer just seen as like, oh, whatever. Like, no, now you can go to jail. You can be convicted. Like, um, mm-hmm. the laws are in place. Even even though, again, people are still very racist and 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 prejudiced and whatnot. Uh, it's not like the 1920s where it's like, oh, you just go around lynching and then we'll just turn a blind eye and pretend we didn't know it was you and and anyways it's just Mm -hmm. interesting now here's a name that 
a lot of people may know. David Duke. <laughs> oh, David Duke. David Duke, the white supremacist politician and Holocaust denier, is still an influential person in the American political life. Back in May 2018, he accused Trump of stealing his Build the Wall slogan, which he says he coined in the 1970s. Um, wow. At the time of Ron's investigation, Duke was the Klan's newly appointed leader or, are you ready for this? The Grand Wizard. <laughs> okay, Harry Potter. A clean cut and reasonable seeming man. Duke is a PR man to his core. In the view of the far right, his greatest achievement was conferring respectability to the KKK banning his members from wearing the hoods and robes in public and aligning the cause with the fundamental Christianity and dissatisfaction with government. So that was the, that, so yeah, this is the transition from outright racism to kind of closeted racism, but still acting yeah, on it yeah. in some ways as best as they could as that they time get away with progress. Yeah. Right. Racial purity is America's security, is the slogan Duke used when he ran for Louisiana state senator as a Democrat. Whatever. I, nothing about this guy's logic. Uh, Trump ran as a Democrat exactly. first. Yeah. Well, and he's still not a Republican now. He's just. And the, oh, God. Anyway, um, Ron established a friendly relationship with Duke over the phone. Surprise, surprise, obviously. Um, he described him as a very pleasant conversationalist. <laughs> uh, Duke presided over Chuck's solemn candlelit naturalization ceremony. I laugh all the time about our investigation, especially about making a fool of David Duke, who likes to think I have the intelligence of an ape because he thinks I'm genetically inferior. How, ca how I con the grand wizard David Duke and his followers. It has defined me in ways I never would imagine. Um, as fascinating as Ron's story is, what did he actually achieve? Well, the sting never resulted in any arrests. Months into investigation, the Klan unexpectedly nominated Ron as its local group leader, and he was forced to finally shut down the investigation because mm. obviously that wasn't going to work. Um, but through their work, Chuck and Ron had foiled a neo-Nazi plot to nail bomb a gay bar. Uh, they identified seven Klansmen who were army personnel. Um, they discovered where the local Klan kept its money. Uh, Ron also uncovered intelligence regarding violent plots um, among black extremists. So he did actually kind of foil some uh, Black Panther stuff. Mm -hmm. Um Oh, yeah. I, I wanted to mention about, oh, the army personnel, um, that they had found out there were some people who, who were in charge of NORAD, which is kind of the, the defense of North and, Northern America, rapid defense, something like that, mm -hmm. um, where it's like the shield against rockets and shit. Um, and don't quote me on that. Something like that. Defense. I'll look at it. Okay. It's like defense. Yeah. And uh, some of them were Klan's members, and um, this information was passed to um, the Pentagon, and a general got that information, and he was like, okay, um, don't worry, we're going to uh, get rid of those guys. We're going to send them to the North Pole. <laughs> so they just re they removed them and basically put them on some other like assignment that was probably like very harsh and uncomfortable mm. and some far away distant distant place um so you know they didn't necessarily like there wasn't a big like, yeah, like oh you're, you're, we you're fired they, but, or but something. there were little yeah. there were little uh achievements that that ron was able to do and again as a fucking black yeah. person <laughs> yeah. Yeah. going against the kkk um so in mid-1979 the investigation was terminated uh, a year later, Duke left the Klan to form the National Association for the Advancements of White People. 
Ron followed his career in law enforcement to Wyoming, Arizona, and Utah, specializing in gangs. When he retired in 2006, he gave that bombshell newspaper interview, and then the FBI called him after the piece went viral because Ron's name, picture, and alleged home address had been published. Dang. And and now it was published on white supremacist websites, and so the FBI was like, um, "You're gonna um, <laughs> watch yourself. <laughs> you're gonna be okay. You're gonna watch yourself." Yeah. Um, after that, I started carrying a gun. Ron said, "But was he frightened?" I have never had a fear of white people. As a child, if anyone called me an N word, my mother would say, "I hope you whooped his ass." <laughs> Ron says that in 1970s, white extremism was considered weird and fanatical, but he's shocked that it has now become mainstream. If someone had predicted it back then, I'd have said they were out of their mind. We've always had people in public office who were more middle ground. They work together. Trump, who is a billionaire, is an quote-unquote educated man, Essentially, has the same messages as Duke had when he was talking to him over the phone. As for the film, Ron says, Spike's take on the book is pretty damn accurate. I got a lot of joy from telling my story. Um, so what was it like for Ron to see his story on the big screen? Mm -hmm. um, in a Vanity Fair article written by Julie Miller, um, Ron said that seeing his undercover experience adapted by Lee for the screen was very surreal, almost like an out of body experience that was sometimes overwhelming. He was clearly familiar with the story of his investigation. Ron said that he was just like the audience stunned to see the way Lee chose to close the film by powerfully juxtaposing the 1970s set racial drama with real life footage from the riots in Charlottesville, Virginia, where white supremacists and neo-Nazis protested the removal of Confederate monuments throughout the South. I sat and I know this is a good movie. movie. This is really, it's like, it's got, and it's also got, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, Kylo Ren. He, he's Chuck. Oh, he's in it. Yeah. Adam driver. He's Chuck. <laughs> and and, oh. and and um uh ron is played by who 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 does every older black woman want to sleep with denzel washington they, thank you denzel washington's son oh his son yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. he's he's ron i was about to say denzel was in that movie <laughs> okay i was like wait what like how do um, you miss this <laughs> yeah, yeah like, <laughs> what um but hey he was and he was amazing he was like i the acting in this movie it's funny too like so it's 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 not just like this overly dramatic and like no no no. so to do mm -hmm. intense drama and be funny with uh, it was good it was good very good i gotta watch i'm pretty sure it's on netflix too uh well not here in costa rica but it may be oh. in the u.s or it might have been taken off. I don't know. I'll look. Um, Ron continues to say that I sat riveted in my seat watching all that unfolded on the screen, as did the people who were in the screening with me. We were amazed by what we saw, and we were shocked by what we saw, and we had no words to describe what we saw once it was over with. We just sat there stunned in silence. Asked what he hopes audience take away from his story, reimagined by Lee when it, arri when it arrived to theaters, Ron said this. I hope they recognize that racism is alive and well, that the Klan has never gone. It's always been around and will continue to be around, and that you shouldn't focus on just a group called the Klan. It's the whole white supremacist movement, no matter what they call themselves, be it Klan, Nazis, alt-right, skinheads, the basic ideology is the same. They consider themselves superior to others because of their white skin, and we should not sleep on that. I would also like them to take away the fact that Donald Trump is the de facto leader of the white supremacist movement right now because he gives them a wink and a nod and basically allows them to say the things that they're saying and do the things that they're doing, like in Charlottesville, without condemning them. He added, in his capacity as the Russian planted occupier of the White House, 
he should be the moral conscience of this nation, but he is far from that. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. And that is my story of Ron Stallworth. When I tried to look up a black detective, Mm -hmm. that was hard because I was only getting this Ron Stallworth and I was only getting the Black Klansman, which I didn't want to cover Uh. because it was like, oh, it's the movie. It's already been done. But just like with the Black Panthers, it's like, okay, it's already been... But then I dove into it, and I was like, oh my god, this story is fantastic. I know, I'm sitting there, that's why I'm like, I should probably be like interjecting or saying something, but like, I'm listening, this is the first, because I haven't watched the movie, so I'm just like, hmm, hmm. Yeah. Hmm. No, it's a great watch, and I mean, just like, I haven't seen it, I'm sure like, whoever will eventually listen to this, they'll be like, yeah, I've been meaning to see the Black Klansman, I hadn't seen it, because... I don't know, like, ah, eh, but you know, now that you know yeah. the story, story, yeah, you'll yeah, want to, yeah, you want to get into it because it's, it's a great story, it's a great movie, and it's well done, um, and it's fun. So, did you see it when it like first came out, or did you like? No, just... I saw it like yesterday. Part of my research. Oh, oh, okay, okay, oh, yeah. okay. Um, it uh, and 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 I was so like, oh my god, the Black Panthers are in it, you know? Like I was like, ah. Oh. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Like I'm a member of the Black Panthers. Now. <laughs> I'm the a member right. of the Black Panthers. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna see you with a shirt on next week. <laughs> um, and they also capture really well how dumb as fuck these people are. <laughs> just dumb as fucking royal fuck, man. It's just the things they say. It's just it doesn't even make me so make, mad. It just makes me like so. It's like it makes no sense. Like, yeah, you're like, not what, racist. What? You're just dumb, just dumb as shit. Mm-hmm. Look, just mm-hmm. so dumb that yeah. Like somebody told you this, like basically your parents or like your friends. Yeah, this is what you should do, and you're like, okay, and they're just going along with it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so yeah, oh, so I'm I'm saying all that because like if somebody's gonna watch it, yeah, um, there's an excessive uh, usage of all usage, the language, yeah. all everything. Yeah. Um, I also said this movie couldn't have come out. Without Donald Trump. It mirrors so much what's going on now. Yes, uh, exactly. You know, yeah. Because maybe before him and before Charlottesville and before all these other things that have come out lately that, no, like, we don't want to mm-hmm. listen about that. Like, that's buried in the past. We're over that. That white nationalists don't exist anymore. Like, why Why would we want to watch that? Like, Which is why I, I am of the feeling that as... As terrible as it as it is, and as bad as it as it is, it's like, yeah, there is a part of me that's like, good. I'm I'm glad that we have Donald Trump to unearth all this stuff and to show really what we as Black people and people of color, like, we were able to recognize that, like, oh yeah, it's plenty of people out here still racist and so prejudiced, and like, mm. we see the microaggressions and all that the different stuff. But now, it's like nobody you can't miss it. Mm-hmm. Uh, whoever you are whatever your background it's there on display to see so i'm kind of yeah i'm kind of of the mindset like yeah i'm glad it 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 is on display like this so you you no longer can anybody who says like oh that was something of the past like it's like okay now you're just choosing to live under a rock i'm just tired at having now explained all of these like stories that we've just told and how like just like that movie nothing's changed i feel like drained from that's what so that guy joaquin phoenix who did the joker mm-hmm. played the joker he won the bafta and nobody this year not a single category was there a person of color mm-hmm. nominated and like he went up and gave his speech and he was like thank you but i just want to say and i'm like paraphrasing um he was like um we send a clear message to people of color that you're not welcome here Mm. and then he goes on to say how it's not people of color's job to like change things it's the people who are perpetuating and benefiting from you know the privilege that you have you guys are the ones that need we are the ones because he was talking about white people he was like we are the ones that have to change things and yeah, he goes on to say like even himself, like he was like, I haven't done enough to make sure like the sets I work on are like more inclusive and everything. And anyways, but I thought that part was a big thing. And they talked about it on the reel. And mm. 
I, I I really liked it. They had a great conversation. And one of the hosts, Amanda Seals, brought up the great point of she was like, it's not our job as people of color to go around trying to explain this is what racism is and this is what's right. And this was not right. She was like, we've been having these conversations for years. Everybody knows what racism is. Everybody knows what's OK, what's not OK. Like now the white people need to turn to their other white brothers and sisters and be like, this is not okay. This is wrong. Like, you know, it's wrong. Like we don't need to ex- explain. And it was funny. Cause I also had that, like I had that realization a few years ago, like when, you know, the, Trayvon Martin was killed and Mike Brown and all those um, guys literally for like a year straight. Like I'm just on Facebook, just like arguing people back. And yeah, just one, it got tiring, but then yeah, it came this realization of like, it's not my job to sit here and try to explain to you why such and such isn't okay. Like if you want to, that's the thing. If you want to know like uh, uh, how somebody else is feeling, you're going to sit and shut up and just listen. Like, so I'm done trying to explain to every single person, like, this is why we feel this way. This is what's wrong, blah, blah, blah. Like, no, it's there. If you don't want to see it, you're choosing not to see it. Mm-hmm. Um, But that's not my job. Even if it's like, you know, like, I, I hate girls who walk around and have like really like, high heels on and they're walking around in public i don't know why it gets me i'm always like girl what you doing if it's a zombie apocalypse or there's somebody about to chase you you're dead or there's a crack on the sidewalk you're dead or your feet are naturally being just destroyed by you doing that because that's not a natural anyways all these things (laughs) but just because i hate it doesn't mean i'm going off and Mm -hmm. grouping with other people and doing all this thing no it's fine. Just have it and go do something good. You know, it doesn't have to run your life. Your hatred shouldn't run your life. Yeah. And in the end, wearing them high heels ain't affecting me at all. At all. Exactly. You should be. I can still hate them and their shoes and, and still be nice to them and exactly. whatever. You should be I don't have to... using your energy for other things. By the way, we've lost an entire female audience. Uh, audience. <laughs> but, okay, but that's what I was going to say. I was going to say, I... It's interesting you say that because I do, yeah. Like it kind of sucks that women, they're not, they don't have to wear heels, but like that is the societal standard. But I think women look gorgeous, like in heels. Like a woman in heels, like it just, it's just like it just elevates them. And so I feel bad saying that, but it's the literally, tr- yes, literally. Um, but it's the truth, yeah. Like I, I think a woman in heels is like, I know it hurts your feet, but like it just it just adds um i mean yes but that's only because i'm trained to accept mm-hmm. that and think that that's like a good look yeah an action hero or superhero who is wearing high heels is not yeah that's not a thing. come on what is this i like, completely agree wear some flats girl you're gonna regret it you're gonna regret it later in life you're gonna have feet problems and all this stuff and um like whoopi wears heels and i love seeing whoopi in heels but she don't wear no no, like stilettos or anything she's like you know very like megan does stilettos along with all the other women on that but she does more well from what i've seen a little bit more like looks like they're stronger (laughs) is what i'm trying to get at they're not like these little pencil like yeah um so have a good um day <laughs> have a good day or have a good evening if you're listening to this at night and um oh if you're listening to this at night this is the late hour i hope you're uh nice and comfy in your bed and i just want to say that uh for all the people listening out there drive safe and drive keep your drive eyes on the road oh, and oh. I was like, how you going to be in your bed and driving? <laughs> I mean, well, if you sleep in your car. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you should um, fight for what you love. That includes yourself. Thanks for listening to the Ants Human Stars podcast with Caleb and Digo. Stay connected and get updates about new episodes by visiting our website, 
antshumanstars.com and by subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. If you enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a positive rating and review and share about us with your community on social media. Thanks, y'all. We really appreciate it.